Fantastic. Okay, Chris, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I firstly apologies. I've had all sorts of problems with broadband and Wi-Fi and this, that, and the other. We've got here eventually. Um, really appreciate you joining me to to have a chat on this podcast. Um, thank you very much for taking the time. It's much appreciated. Johnny, thank you so much for having me here and thrilled to to dive in today. I think it's going to be a good time. Good stuff. Good stuff. So. So we first kind of got into a conversation in uh, Dallas in Texas um, when we were both there around the CWS summit. Um, and we got talking about your love of data and your passion for, for data and analytics and my passion and interest in the services procurement statement of world statement of work side of things and kind of looked to the intersection of that. And we started out on a really kind of quite interesting conversation, bit of a debate. Um, and we just, you know, following that, we just said, look, we should get this onto a podcast. And I'm really glad we're going to do that today. Um, so to start things off, let me just give you a, a little bit of an introduction. And then you can kind of uh, maybe give people a bit of a flavor of your journey through the industry, what you've done, what you're doing now. Um, but yeah, just to introduce you formally, Chris Radvansky, uh, principal of Rad Consultants. So and over to you now to uh, give a bit of background. Absolutely, Johnny. Thank you so much. And that was a great conversation that we had down in Dallas at the CWS, uh, enjoying the high top tables on the first floor and uh, seeing what we could see with all the people in the space. But uh, yeah, no, thank, again, thank you so much for, for having me here. Uh, I am now with Rad Consultants after more than 10 years with a larger VMS and MSP. Uh, you can do some math and uh, some LinkedIn <laughs> research yourself. Um, but yeah, I for, for the longest time, I always enjoyed math and I enjoyed numbers. My dad with a ma was a math teacher. My aunt was a senior accountant within uh, GlaxoSmithKline back in the day. And it's just kind of been in my blood. I, you know, honors math, the whole thing. And I went on uh, to, to get my accounting degree, to get my certified public accountant uh, certification, which is now quite dusty, but that's okay. Uh, essentially, it showed that I have the ability to learn these complex subjects, whatever they might be, right? And that's kind of what what uh, you know, folks that attain some level of certification, whether it's a master's degree, uh, a certification within the industry, uh, showing that aptitude is something that's important. Mine was around numbers, data, finances, things like that. So when I started with Magnet, well, I'll say it now, Magnet, uh, Pro Unlimited back in the day, back in 2012. Uh, I was really the day-to-day -day analyst for one of our largest clients. Uh, what does that mean, analyst? What does that mean day-to-day? -day? Well, I sat with our MSP team. I understand, understood that the program contains all these different pieces of data from you know, supplier performance and individual business units and rate trending and spend and you, you name it. It's some piece of data that's captured by the VMS. It was my job to digest that to analyze it within Excel, within other uh, dashboarding tools, and then to tell the story to my program sponsors. So I had you know a lot of face time with our program sponsors, telling them what does the state of fog population look like, and also what does the SOW population look like. And it was during that time period from, from going from one account to the next, and then ultimately achieving the rank of vice president of reporting and analytics there, uh, seeing all the different ways in which clients were engaging with non-employee talent uh, and seeing how, well, yeah, we can tell a story, we can speak anecdotally, we can bring in qualitative insights that are coming from our hiring managers, that are coming from our suppliers, that are coming from workers, but we can augment that with hard, real data that's being captured through these transactional systems. Uh, I, I really enjoyed... Uh, understanding that this is another leg, data is another leg that companies need to stand on to make better decisions. That's just a fact. Uh, everybody knows that, everybody hears about it. It's just a matter of, is everybody actually acting on it? And that's really where Rad Consultants is saying, hey, listen, let's optimize the data that you have your fingertips. Uh, chances are, if it's out there in some system, and then maybe you download it into an Excel file, you have the folks that are knowledgeable within data and within the contingent labor space to optimize that data. And if not, then that's where we're kind of swinging in here. So, that, But uh, yeah, thank you so much, Johnny. And, and am I done now? Is, is it over? Is it, can I stop sweating? No, 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 no. This is, just, this is just the beginning. Your legendary energy must be tested. Um, Fair enough. Let's give but, it a go. 
that's a great intro. Um, you know, makes a lot of sense. And, you know, your just your raw enthusiasm and energy um, for this topic. And you, just meeting you, you've clearly got a very inquiring, keen mind. You also got a lot of curiosity. I know we spoke about AI, had a really interesting chat about AI as well. We'll, we'll probably come on to that in the context of this um, a little bit later in the conversation. Um, but it was it was quite interesting because I've got quite strong viewpoints around the differences between statement of work and services procurement and staff augmentation. And you've got quite strong views around, hey, let's not mess around. You've got to have proper data. The more uniform it is, the better. Logical, straightforward, clinical approach, which is exactly what's required. Um, I think the the thing that for me makes that conversation particularly interesting is because it's, it's, it's an intersection um, where the staff augmentation or contingent workforce industry is trying to break ground in a new area that is significantly different. Ultimately, it all comes under the, I wouldn't say it comes under the umbrella of non-employed talent myself, because I'd be quite pedantic about it. I'd say, if you're engaging under a statement of work, it's not about the talent, it's about an outcome or an output. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I always kind of think of it as like extended workforce. But organisations that are coming at it from a standpoint where their their absolute bread and butter, their area of expertise is talent, generally non-employee talent, there are grey areas. So there are organisations, that end organisations that would say, oh, we need to look at our statement of work consultants. Things like that sometimes come up. And I'm kind of like, what even is that? You know, let's let's get a clear demarcation here. But there are grey areas. Um, I think with, with and, and so with regards to the data side of it, that throws up some really interesting questions in the sense that if you look at contingent workforce, it's going to be fairly clear to you if you go into an organisation and you run an assessment on an audit on what's going on, you're going to have a pretty clear idea of firstly, whether they've got the right data. And secondly, what you can do with that data. Is that kind of pretty fair to say in terms of how you'd go about that type of audit? Yes, absolutely. I think that when you're, you know, you said a lot of things and you ask a very specific question. So let me try to adjust <laughs> the specific question and let you get back to it. Um, but what we'll do is if you're doing that kind of an audit, if uh, in an audit, when you're downloading data, you just say, okay, let's analyze this. What is this telling me? Where are our volumes? When you see, and historically what I've seen, a breakdown of many different ways in which we can break down our staff augmentation workforce spend headcount fills you name it break it down by job category by job title by location by supplier by business unit you name it you can do that within staff all when you look for that same breakdown you're looking at for very frequently with an sow one line item it is not broken down um and that's because the level of granularity in which the program uh, governance is set up is historically not as stringent, not as many requirements or boxes that need to be populated uh, when it comes to SOW. And therefore that audit, you can maybe get to that high level number, but when you want to break that down, go a level deeper, go a level deeper, go a level deeper, that's frequently impossible because the data is just not there. So, you've kind of outlined from a from a from an audit point of view going into organization looking at what they've got the kind of the differences between um the problems with what data they may have around statement of work and services procurement versus um staff augmentation um but if we drill a little bit deeper than that what do you see as the other problems with the data around sow maybe even if you could drill deeper what 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 do you see as the issues there well, if you can drill deeper, that means that you have more questions that you can ask, right? Every, every good question, the answer will give you two more questions to ask, right? And that's really where we want to be going. This new level of visibility that you might achieve as a first gen uh, MSP, you know, program, whatever you, you might be, first gen VMS, all of a sudden, wow, we have all this data. This is terrific. Now I can start asking questions. Before it was, you don't know what you don't know. And that's always a big problem. You need to, you don't know what questions you can start asking if you have no idea of the scope. You don't know if it's worth asking the questions if, if you have no idea of the scope. So that's where the visibility is gonna be coming in important. Um, but if let's say you do have this level of data and you do 
as part of your governance structure, you mandate collecting certain pieces of data. And you can do that. You know, an SOW program is what the end buyer deems is necessary. That's why all these programs are configured in such a way that they're all pretty and unique snowflakes. Um, however, a lot of the SOW volume sits kind of at, at a very high level in terms of what is being captured. But if you do capture it, then you can start asking, okay, well, how long did this project take place? Mm -hmm. uh, how how many different workers were associated with it in and out within the project? Do you want to know that? Some It's a strategic decision. Sometimes the answer is yes, I want to know. Sometimes the answer is no, I'll just leave that to the vendor. And that's that's okay. It's just a matter of recognize that that's a decision that you need to make. It's not just something that you should avoid. You don't know that you should be asking that to begin with know these regular questions that should be coming up uh, when you're governing, when you're implementing your program. Um, so understanding all the different pieces within the SOW at the sourcing process, are there multiple different bids that are being captured? Are we capturing worker? Are we capturing rates? Are we capturing the type of skills that are gonna be assigned to this? And again, timelines and exact deliverables. If you capture all that information, you have a treasure trove. It might be a little bit you know, case by case by case, but you roll up the cases, you know, you don't get to insights by looking at granular level requisition level information. You get to insights by finding that happy medium between we have a $300 million program to we have Sally Jones that has worked for the last five, you know, five weeks on our, on our job. Neither of those provide a level of insight that you need. There's that happy medium, that gray zone that's in between granularity and a macro level that is really where you can start finding out how should we change the program? How should we make different decisions so that we can improve cost savings and efficiency down the line? Yeah, I think yeah. one of the interesting things for me is looking at the difference between a staff org scenario, contractors, temps, um, versus statement of work. Because so I would always describe the two things very simply as staff augmentation is paying an individual for their time, whereas getting something done under a statement of work is paying an organization to deliver an output or an outcome. Do you think that within organizations and customer organizations at the moment and within the MSP environment, do you think it's as clear as that? Or is the, or are, am I kind of missing out the gray scale stuff that kind of sits in the middle? Well, fortunately you and I are in different countries and therefore I can say it depends <laughs> and because it does. Uh, it is going to depend a lot on the regulations of the certain location that you're in, the nature of the business that you have yourself as an end as an end buyer, let's say, or end user, whatever you might want to say. What type of business are you in? Is that work that's being done, whether it's staff, org, or project, is that in direct alignment with what you're doing, or is that something that kind of you also need to get done? However, it's not part of your own value proposition. So the answer is it depends. Now, everyone hates that answer, but it's also generally the right answer almost 100% of the time. Um, so you really need to understand all the ins and outs and the requirements from a regulatory and, and governmental state to then answer that question. Uh, so unfortunately, that is the case, uh, but that's where you need specialists. That's where you need to, to lean on the people, whether it's within your organization or outside of it, that have the answers to these resources to understand, okay, are we going to be in trouble if we conduct business in this way, or are we good to go? Uh, and even within the United States, let's say they have the IRS has all these different questions in which they need to determine: is this a valid business type, business to business type of relationship? And the IRS publishes these questions, and generally we're supposed to go through each of them and say this is a fully, you know, arm's length type of a relationship. Uh, it's appropriate. This person has no co-employment risk. We're good to go. Um, however, there's times where the actual court cases that are assessing co-employment will counter the assumed answers from this IRS questionnaire. So therefore, they're what is it, talking the talk, but not walking the walk, as we say here. So how can we really be certain that we are compliant? You need to make sure that you're up to date on all the rules of the land and the latest rules as well. And that's why there's all these different... Uh, white papers and, and podcasts such as this to make sure people understand how important that is. Yeah, I mean, although obviously for me being in the UK and you being in the US, there are differences. I think there are also great similarities in the sense that there's uh, some grey areas and there's also some slightly uh, 
less than um, less than 100 percent persuasive government guidance on it that gets questioned by the common kind of uh, lawsuits. So so fairly similar. Um, I mean, obviously, both modes of operation are about getting work done. Um, that it's 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 extended workforce. It's how an organisation utilises external capacity and capability, whether it's um, Jane and Bob doing some work on an hourly basis, or whether it's supplier X delivering a service, whatever that may be. Um, and I guess, and, and one of the interesting things I found about I, I thought about our conversation originally was clearly for somebody who's focused on the data, you ideally want consistency, and you want to have common denominators that you can use across the areas that you're assessing. To basically be able to carry out, a, you know, comparative analytics in some sort of meaningful way, um, so you want as much data as you can get, that's as simple as possible, and so that you can answer the questions that the business is asking you with good evidence. Um, but I would put forward that statement of work data um, is far more complicated than just hourly and daily rates. And would would you say there is greater complexity in that data, or is it just different information? We roll it up. Ultimately, we need to put these 50 different SOW projects together and we need to say something about them. We can say, well, in aggregate, they they cost $20 million, right? Each individual project costs three million here, a million and a half here, five hundred thousand there. Those are common numbers that we can all agree on that yes, this is one thing that we can define, that we can measure. We recognize that they are all indeed projects. They all have a start date. They all have an end date, unless you just kind of keep going renewal, renewal, renewal. Um, so there are ways in which that you can say everybody's talking the same language. But then of course, every one of those projects has a lot of intricacies that you might say, well, this is very, very different. This is that unique snowflake that is going to be something that we can't compare to other ones. And that's that's fine. That's that's why you go down this path of, of SOW uh, relationships. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you need to say, okay, we've been transacting business for five years, right? We've engaged in with 15 different SOW vendors over that five-year period. There is some commonality within our transactions within our projects. And then you say, okay, now that we have assessed all of our history, now we can maybe make some better decisions about governance going forward. You know, the, the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. The next best time is today. So if you recognize that, well, shoot, we, we've been not doing that for five years, therefore we can't do it today. No, you can start today. It's just a matter of leveraging the data that is in arrears, assessing it and saying, damn it, if we had, better data five years ago, we'd be able to make better decisions today. Start implementing that structure and that governance today. And that way in five years, you'll be in much better shape. Yeah, so if you learn more about an outcome, you can manage the outcome more effectively. Um, you've talked about peeling back the layers in a statement of work. Um, obviously on the contingent workforce side, uh, staff augmentation, the base unit of measurement is gonna be an hourly rate or a day rate. Do you think you can get to a base unit of measurement within services procurement? I don't think that's something that is, you know, because again, you, you'd said that, well, it's not exactly not employee labor. You're just looking to get a project done. It's also not widgets, right? So you're not looking for a specific volume of a specific thing and each one costs however many per unit, right? So W is not the same, but also again, that's uniquely different from staff augmentation. So there does need to be that level of flexibility built within your systems and built within your processes. Uh, but if they're built there, they also need to be documented. So you need to, whether it's within your, your system again, uh, where you have all these different assumptions built within uh, you know, a type of a workflow, or if it's within a policy that says, listen, this is how we conduct business. This is the, the suppliers that we transact with and the way in which we transact with them. Um, if you document this, you're going to have something that you can go back and say, All right, this is this is our best practice, and this is why we're doing it this way. So I'm always a fan of documentation uh, that enables better clarity and communication. I think communication is so critical uh, to build bridges between individuals, to have some consistency across your organization, uh, and have something to point to and say, listen, this is why we're doing things this way. And when something else pops up that, hey, this is brand new territory for us, 
Let's write that down. Let's identify who's the owner of it. Let's identify the processes and what could go wrong if we build a process this way. So, uh, you know, that's, that's all I have to say about that for now. Yeah, and I 100% agree with you. And I think that's exactly the sort of approach organizations need to take, particularly when they're dealing with something new and complicated um, like SOW. When I say new, I mean more new in that kind of MSP environment or newer than the, the staff or contingent uh, workforce kind of standard type stuff. Um, so do you see it as, with regards to looking at the data within Statement of Work, do you see it as more as a comparison within Statement of Work? Or, or are you looking at this as a comparison across statement of work, staff org, and all different areas? I think that what needs to happen, and, and this is something actually I just had a conversation uh, very recently with a MSP program manager and a staffing supplier. And essentially it was, well, you know, within a couple of my clients, we have the IT organization is leveraging SOW a lot more than they would be le they're leveraging IT. And therefore... Um, we will not be leveraging our staffing suppliers as much because we're going to be using IT that much more. However, if you do an analysis of these SOW projects, there might be a lot of them that have one worker. And historically, what I've seen, this might be anecdotal, but I think it's true based upon all the conversations I've had in the last couple of months, is that there are just fewer roadblocks to getting an SOW approved as a, as compared to a headcount. A headcount right now is seen as something that isn't uh, very much an added cost versus maybe an SOW is something that, well, listen, we need to get this done and therefore it costs us this much. Can we get that approved? The answer is seemingly more frequently yes, then you'll get the yes from the contingent worker staff org space. Um, so I think what is now happening is staffing suppliers are saying, you know what? Well, if that's the case, maybe I should dip my toes into the SOW vendor space. Maybe I should kind of restructure and rejig my service offering to be uniquely situated where, hey, yeah, we do staffing, staff augmentation, but also we do projects. We can absolutely do that. And they'll leverage the same folks that they would leverage and send over within the staff aug sourcing uh, process. And they would say, all right, well, you know what, we're going to have some more Salesforce activity coming through here. We're going to have some more, um, you know, Java projects that, that might be coming up. And we want to make sure that we have a three or a five or a seven person team that's ready to go when that SOW comes across. Now that might come across a little bit easier because those staffing suppliers that are now SOW suppliers, maybe they don't have a competitive bidding SOW process. So instead of competing against other staffing suppliers for staff org work, they might just be winning an SOW project that is coming up in August or, or, or December, whatever it might be. And that might be an easier process. Is it the most cost effective by make, being able to make decisions and comparing rates to rates to quality to quality that we're doing within staff org? It's no. I mean, the answer is no. Um, however, is it easier? As I mentioned, it, it might be a little bit easier. Yeah. And does that ease come with a tolerance for a higher overall cost? Maybe. Uh, and that, again, those are conversations and questions that companies have to ask themselves when they're establishing you know, their, their processes. You know, I think it's so fascinating. And that is partly me being a bit geeky, but just looking, <clears throat> understanding this part of the industry, uh, or having been involved in it in the way that I have, this is where it brings up this kind of gray area. Because if you're looking at best practice around uh, delivering outcome-based uh, services, that's kind of different to what we, you're talking about there, which is to a certain extent what, what we would call in the UK body shopping. Um, yeah. it's, it's almost like disguised contracting in a way, because there's kind mm -hmm. of there's two sides of it that are being a little bit naughty, maybe. There's the buy side of it that are just getting around headcount restrictions and just basically just just get it done another way. And then there's the the vendor side of it that are kind of like packaging it up. Uh, but actually, it's behind the scenes, it's contractors. But to be honest, both of them are kind of have their own legitimacy, because if the supplier is packaging it up effectively and taking on the delivery risk um, and it's contracted in the right way, what's kind of the mechanics behind the scenes shouldn't really matter. Um, because ultimately, but this is where it kind of bleeds into the sort of the, the middle bit is where it ends up being fundamentally based on time and rates so it'll be 
an amount of time at certain rates, and then it'll just have an extension. It'll have another extension, have another extension. It's just it, it's just contracting basically. However, where there is an outcome or an output that is defined, it will have some time associated with it. But that's the supplier's problem to work that out. They've got to work out whether it's a profitable piece of work for them to do based on the timings and the and the amount they're going to pay uh, get paid for it, and where the liability sits. Um, as to whether that's you know logical for them to do it in that way. So I think you could almost look at it as go, there's the contingent workforce staff org side of things. And then there's this, in my opinion, very messy kind of blended sort of quasi SOW stuff in the middle that's kind of like maybe shades of grey, sits kind of across both, where the, the, the standard unit, unit of measurement could potentially still be broken down to hours or days. And then you've got what I would class as proper services procurement, a proper statement of work where that's irrelevant. It's an output or an outcome. Clearly, in proper services procurement, occasionally there are going to be certain elements of something that might have a time based element to it. Ten days of consulting is part of that package, but it's just an overall delivery. It doesn't matter who's doing it. You don't need to know that. You just need to know that it's done and it's done properly. Um, so, so for me, this is an absolutely fascinating uh, area to explore. And I'm really glad to be able to kind of bring in your insights with it as well. Because and John, to, to put a, a term on it, when I, I, I've heard, you know, within SOW, you have two different types, and this might not be re revelatory to you, but fixed bid versus time and materials, where uh, SOW time and materials, you are capturing individual workers, you're capturing how much they're billing and, and things like that. However, it is still a project, and that is historically owned by procurement. So the suppliers and all the other folks, that's a, less of a piece of a pie in the staff org space, but it's still time and materials. So to your point, it is that gray area and there's two different types of projects do exist. Now the balance between, well, are we gonna engage with time and materials more? Or are we gonna engage with fixed bid more? And I would say that is heading over to the fixed bid space. And you know, the, the reason, whether this is the reason or, or not, but my hypothesis, is that it seems to be just a general obfuscation of data and facts. If we say, listen, we we don't, and, and that's where regulation that is all over co-employment, that's why my former employer came into being because of the Microsoft case back in 1991. Uh, and they say, okay, well, you know, this is co-employment risk. And then all of a sudden, all the lights were shined on non-employees and their, you know, business relationship with their quote unquote employers or Alliance, I guess, if you wanted to call it back then. Um, so if the regulations are focused on staff augmentation, okay, how, who are your workers? What are they doing? You know, how, how long have they been around? Which is sometimes argued something that's very important. They've been around for six years. Well, they're definitely an employee. Well, that's not actually the case. However, it's a good data piece to collect and monitor if you want to make sure that you're, you're optimizing your cost and your markups and things like that. But I digress. So the regulation is there for the staff augmentation population. Is the regulation as much there in the SOW space? You might know this answer better than I do, but my guess is not as much. Um, and if we can continue saying, well, listen, this project cost me $15 million. I don't know anything more than that. At least nothing more is captured in the system. Is somebody forcing the hand, hey, wait a second, we need to find out a little bit more about this relationship. Well, it's a very, very large, you know, big four vendor, or it's a very, very large IT professional services vendor, and therefore we don't need to find out more. Okay. And all of a sudden, millions and millions of dollars that are being transacted between these very large companies is going just, oh, okay, I don't know any more about it. These two companies seem like they're, they've been legacy. They've been around for 50 plus years. No more questions asked versus the stay of all population. Somebody's billing $50,000 a year. All of a sudden that has a lot more regulation around it. And that's a bit odd to me. And that might be something that should be changing, in my opinion. Yeah, it's interesting because what we're talking about here does have different contractual and legal considerations, partly depending on where you are. But the kind of co-employment type laws between the UK and the US, for example, there's some there's some broad similarities. <clears throat> if you, My take on it is that the contingent workforce space is quite highly regulated and it's quite hot, it's quite clear, as clear as these not very clear government assessment systems make it um it's pretty clear where you should what you should be doing in terms of regulating the sow space 
it kind of doesn't need regulating in itself because it's a business to business interaction that's that's be, a, a company's being paid to deliver a service they either do what's contracted or they don't do what's contracted that's as far as it goes but the regulations that apply to the contingent workforce laws are relevant in that space where people are blurring the lines so what we see a lot of the time is is companies getting quite nervous if there's a lack of differentiation between what they're classing as statement of work and what they're classing as staff augmentation I mean, you know, we talked about, um, you talked about, ultimately, if you can't measure hours, you got nothing. What have you got? Well, I I would kind of, I would put forward uh, the assertion that in in services procurement, you're going to be measuring different things. And it comes down to that word outcomes, which is, which is something where it's, it's, it's a totally different thing. If you're, if you're engaging workers, individuals under a certain period of days, hours, whatever it might be, that's kind of on the never never potentially in terms of how long it's going to take but you know you've got people at a certain level doing work and that's what people are used to a lot of the time i've got people working on it they're doing their best we're moving along how long is it going to take uh, kind of don't really know it's, it's harder to tie that down but you know what you're paying per hour per day and you can feel comfortable with that with an outcome as you said sometimes people might look at it and go outsourcing it is a higher overall cost but i would question that that's not necessarily going to be the fact all of the time in the sense that the supplier is taking the risk for delivery. And if it's contracted effectively with clear outcomes set out, um, they're either going to deliver them or they're not. And actually, in terms of how expensive that's going to end up being against contracting is up for debate. Plus, you don't have that delivery risk if it ends up taking longer or if something goes wrong. So the things that typically would get measured in services procurement are different. They're more like, if I look at my supply base, how many projects have they run? Uh, what's their average win ratio? What's their average cost overrun? Um, at a milestone level on every project they've worked on, how often are they on time, on budget? How often does the scope change? You can make some really interesting analysis around that, but it's different criteria. So I think that's like ideal world textbook statement of work services procurement. Right. However, we do have this and if you look at it from a, if you think about it from a kind of MSP contingent workforce point of view, what's the entry point going to be? It's not going to be going from contingent workforce straight into the most sophisticated services procurement. It's going to be contingent workforce into whatever's adjacent to it, as far as statement of work goes. So, but but when you were talking earlier, you were saying about potentially this skew more towards fixed bids and more outcome based. What do you think are the drivers? that are pushing in that direction. It's interesting. And this is something you and I talked about down in Dallas is that one of my projects, I said, Hey, listen, well, this will probably take me this many hours and uh, I can be done by this date and, and it'll cost this much. Right. And they can kind of back into, well, what's Chris's hourly rate for this? And like, okay, great. Um, I was asked actually to, to remove the number of hours that it would take me. Um, And again, that's, I'm giving you data. I'm intentionally giving you this. And you're intentionally saying, I don't want the data. Again, that's a governance decision that they're making to say, all right, what do we not want to know? Because it might raise questions. And I think that's a curious, odd thing. But I, I understand it because the regulation that is around that. They'd rather put the rug over some pieces of information just to avoid uh, avoid anything that could be perceived as non-compliance. Um, but ultimately, what was, you know, if, if you're a vendor there, you say, okay, well, then it's actually going to cost you more. Like you, you could increase it and then they don't want to kind of raise, raise an eyebrow at it. So uh, it, it is curious to me and the whole scenario that you just walked through about, well, how, how is that vendor performing? How long does it take? How, how many days are they past their milestone date that was agreed to in the contract? That's assuming that you're capturing all that information within the contract, but within the VMS. And, and that's where you can structure that kind of a workflow to, hey, you know, and, and measure a little bit more equitably and equally, you know, consistently. Um, but overall, that's that's not happening, I would say seven times out of 10, if I can be generous. Uh, and sometimes that, that might be intentionally, uh, as I just kind of uh, painted the picture there. And what, what do, would you say is the majority limiting factor on that? Is it the capability 
within some VMS systems to actually capture that level of detail on statement of work? Or is it the lack of the kind of process input coming from the, the client side or the supply side? I think that all the VMSs out there are very interested in having the latest and greatest and best SOW module, Zivio included here, right? Go Zivio. Um, and you're willing to say, listen, client, this is uh, what we can capture. This is all the different fields that might be relevant for all your SOWs. Uh, and if you need to you know, configure it in a certain way, rename things, we can. However, we recognize this is how an SOW works. Uh, it, it does have milestones. It has end dates, estimated end dates, the, the, a process for renewals, a process for extensions, all this different stuff. And, you know, we have to redline. We want to throw addendums onto the, the PDF document itself. We want to capture that within the SOW module. Absolutely. All the VMSs, in my opinion, are either doing that or are you know working towards that end. Um, it's on the buyer to take advantage of all the features of a piece of software. And a lot of times that that's not the case for consumers as well. Um, but I just I see the adoption of that level of granularity within the SOW space for these software. Uh, the adoption on the buyer side is just is not there. Uh, I'm a little bit curious myself as to why, but I think it, again, it's just the regulation. It comes back to that, like, well, if we, don't, or or the interest, or maybe even could be uh, a, a lack of understanding as to the benefit of capturing that. Is that just data for the sake of data, or is that data that I can action upon? Um, and maybe they don't have the bandwidth, right? And you say, look, I, I do see how I can action that, but I'm not going to spend time, you know, uh, going through, through all this data to make an adjustment so that maybe next time around in six months, they'll deliver it a month sooner than they did you know, previously. So you gotta understand that if there's meat on the bone, if there's bandwidth for people to actually you know, make action on it, those are all different considerations you have to, to bring into play. Yeah, really, really interesting point. What you've just been talking through there uh, makes me feel quite good about our approach to the world because I think you know, adoption it's a critical factor. If you look at, so so we we would class ourselves as a VMS for services procurement. We only do services procurement. So we don't do contingent workforce. We don't do hourly day rate stuff. It's just purely statement of work. So that, what that, and I'm not trying to look to just blow our own trumpet here, but I'm just talking strategically. That allows you as an organization to focus on that particular use case. And That's my it. view of the world is services procurement and statement of work is different. It's different enough that you need to consider it differently. I'm passionately believe that ties into the to the adoption side of it in the sense that my belief is if your original starting point is contingent workforce and then you add a module specifically designed to deal with something else, you're still going to have some carryover of that original approach. Now, I'm no Nostradamus, but my prediction is that people are going to want one thing, you know, one ring to rule them all in one scenario, in some scenarios. And in other scenarios, they're going to want specialists that interface in the correct way because you're dealing with different stakeholders. So if it was just contingent workforce category managers and talent acquisition and HR people dealing with that statement of work stuff, they probably just want to try and push it into as much of a similar scenario as the contingent workforce as they could get away with within, within the regulatory framework. But if you look at procurement, they don't. They want to do it properly. They want to do it in a procurement way, which is to, to be honest, partly where I think the leap is or the steps that need to be taken for the MSP providers to, to bridge that gap, to get to be able to offer those stakeholders as good a service as they can offer their contingent workforce stakeholders. So, so when you look at it like that, this is a huge greenfield area for data analytics, because if there's a very limited amount of information being captured thus far, and it's it's limited to hourly rates and day rates, which won't apply to a lot of this stuff. And where it is, it's on a little bit of shaky ground. Just imagine when you start getting into the true metrics around statement of work, nobody's really doing that. So so in, in the way that we look at the world, we're looking at on time, on budget, to scope, what's the win ratio, what's the cost overrun? Because you need to be able to compare suppliers on a like-for-like -like basis. Have they got X and Y capabilities? And how reliable are they at doing what they're contracted to do? So you're absolutely right in talking about how that you need to capture the contracted details effectively. You need to be able to systemize deliverables, milestones, whatever those milestones might be. 
They could be pure deliverables, could be a sprint in an agile uh, development process, could be a KPI, could be a block of, t of, of time, for example. So there were, there were lots of facets to it. Um, capturing that information is one thing, measuring it as an, uh, is another, but there's that like-for-like -like measurement across those suppliers. So I think that's where there's the, the room to go. What that makes difficult, so that ends up putting contingent workforce and statement work in two different boxes. You're measuring different things. So then you've got the challenge of going, okay, if you're measuring outcomes over here, the company that are designing work around outcomes need to put quite a lot of thought into it. What do I want to achieve with this? Where's the end point? How much do I think that should cost? And maybe in the, on the other side of it, they'll be thinking, well, I'll cost it out what I think that would cost on a, um, a, a staff augmentation basis. And maybe they can make some sort of comparison. But they also have to layer into that other factors like the legal responsibility for delivery will sit with the supplier. Um, and you're kind of guaranteed an outcome with that. Whereas with this, it could extend and you don't really know how far it's going to go. So that, I think, for me, will be the point where it can get really fascinating, where organisations can look at their different workforce channel. What if I get this work done through permanent channels? Um, you know, what if I outsource it? What if I if I staff it up with contractors? That's where the really clever decisions around um, uh, kind of strategic workforce planning need to take place. But they've got to be fed by data. It feels at the moment like SOW is, is either a kind of bottomless pit of zero data or there's some data that's kind of staff org and people are tr maybe tr want to measure it instinctively in that way when it's part of a, an MSP program. But it feels like there's a long way to go. Uh, yeah, and I, I would say it's a bit of an uphill battle. So you say that there's a you know opportunity here for better data analytics around SOW, and I agree. However, if you start with the absence of data and say, all right, let's get to an analysis, um, you're going to be done your job very, very quickly, right? So we need to make sure that those folks out there rec need to recognize that, well, you need data to make better decisions. You know, you shouldn't have data without recommendations, and you shouldn't have recommendations without data, right? So if we're recommending something, that better be driven by data. If we have data, I don't want data for the sake of data. I don't want data so it you know, makes our databases enormous and say, look at us, we have a lot of information here, but we have data so we can make better recommendations. So that, that's just one point I wanted to make. Um, in terms of Vivio and an SOW uh, VMS module, or you know, just a standalone VMS even, that's something that is so important. I think that in the age of AI, if I can say those two two letters right now, um, hyper-specialization is going to be really, really important. Leveraging experience and real world you know, history is going to be something that's very important. Now, I, with Rad Consultants, I am in an industry that not a lot of people outside of people watching this podcast right now have heard of. And when you talk about data and analytics, uh, it's a space that a lot of, not a lot of people, you know, maybe they've heard of it, of course, but do they really know what it means and can they implement it in any way? Probably not as well. So I'm in a hyper-specialized space in a niche industry, in a niche area, but that's needed because we are getting to a level of hyper-specialization. And I kick this off with AI because AI is a really great generalist. It has no experience. It can read, of course, but it's a terrific generalist. Uh, and if you haven't done it and you haven't said, give me 10 reasons why I should do X within your contingent labor program, even, it'll give you 10 reasons. And then you say, oh, you know what? Uh, give me breakdown item number one with five different bullet points. It'll do that. And then do that for number two and number three and number four. And it gives you that and you got, boom, you got a big old white paper after 10 minutes of work and just iterating on this generalist information. However, when we talk about hyper-specialization, that's where it's going to give you hallucinations, which if you don't know, those are just facts that are wrong, <laughs> but they sound darn good. Um, so that's where you need to learn, lean on those experts within that specialized niche. Uh, and as humans, we need to recognize that's where our value is going to lie. Our value is going to lie in the things that we have lived and breathed and know and can speak uh, for, for a very long time about. Uh, so find that hyper-specialization, uh, recognize that this is the value that I can bring because when you talk about value versus scarcity versus ab abundance, we now have abundant general you know, consulting at our fingertips. We, the scarcity and the value 
comes from the hyper-specialization in a very specific field. But that specific field needs to have a lot of meat on the bone. And in the growing non-employee workforce space, there's a lot of meat on the bone. There's going to be more and more companies that unfortunately say, you know what, we don't need as many employees as we used to have. And therefore, you're going to have a lot more growth within one to five person companies that are going to be saying, OK, we can drive value. We have the skills to uh, contribute to a skills based organization. Uh, and therefore, we can offer that 10 hours a week here, 30 hours a month there uh, and, and, you know, for, for these end clients. So instead of having one full time employer you have 10 different clients. Uh, and that is a very real possibility as companies are recognizing we only need folks that we need. We don't want to carry a 30,000 person uh, employee base. We want to carry one that's maybe 20,000 or 15,000 and then figure out, plug those folks that we don't need on full time, plug them in as, as needed within our skills-based organization. So that's a little bit of my diatribe about the importance of a very specific software such as Zivio as a very specific vendor such as myself with uh, contingent labor analytics. Um, but also I think that it's a growing need in general across the market. Well, do you know what? I found it really inspiring chatting to you in Texas, you, just your passion around the AI stuff. I think I was telling you about what we've been doing around requirement sourcing, uh, requirements, scope creation, sorry, um, with our interface with uh, GPT-4 Turbo um, yeah. and, and some of the cool stuff we're doing around that, which I'm actually um, going to be showcasing next week at a conference in London. And, and one of the things that I came away from the conversation with you thinking was, if I'm not using a generative AI platform, whether it's chat GPT or something else, if I'm not using that every single day, I'm doing something wrong. If I'm not trying to take some value from that every day, and I've actually set myself that task that I have to basically ask generative AI at least one question every day, because it comes down to that whole thing of people talking about AI taking people's jobs. My opinion, and I can't remember whether this is something that you've also subscribed to or not, but people who use AI are going to take other people's jobs. <laughs> In the sense yeah. that, you oh. know, you can you can stand there and you can look at it and go, this is scary. This is weird. It is. But also it's a tool. And if it's used effectively in the right in the right scenarios and you understand the limitations, um, it is a tool that people can adopt right now in their personal and professional lives um, to elevate what they're doing. So I think it's a very worthwhile point to bring up. And when you start getting into like complex dealing with complex scenarios, like, for example, services, become there's a lot of complexity you know in terms of looking at contracts looking evaluating suppliers writing requirements there's all sorts of things that these large language models can be directed towards and guided through specialist providers actually tuning what they're asking and how they're how they use utilizing that ai it's a, as you say it's a generalist when you tune it for a specialist purpose you're less likely to get those kind of hallucinations you're more likely to if it's factual information where there's a large amount of data available to the generative ai model um, you can get some pretty useful stuff out of it. So I think you're absolutely right to, to bring that up. And I, I would also say, I think the, the thing I learned from, took away from you about making sure I'm using it every day. I think everybody should be, should be trying to think along those lines to say, how can this add value to what I'm doing rather than taking away from what I'm doing? Yeah. So, um, with open AI's dev day, which was, I guess, last Monday, I forget when it was now, but they released the, the ability to, create GPTs, which are essentially your own bespoke, trained up chat GPTs. You can dictate it how you want it to operate. Do you want it to access the internet or do you want to only allow it to access the data or the knowledge that you're uploading in your creation of that GPT? I've created one over the last couple of days called Rad Workforce Guru. Check it out out there if, if you're able to, to find that on LinkedIn. Um, but essentially where we were before with hallucinations, oh, I don't want to upload my own uh, internal data sets. And, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about that. And as you should be, I mean, there, this is something that we still need to be guarded against because of the implications of adding this massive amount of intelligence for free to everybody all over the world. That's essentially what we're doing. But if we know how to build it, we know how to leverage it in, uh, in a way that is suiting our needs, that's aligned with our goals, then that's where, yes, absolutely, it is a tool. It is a tool, uh, Excel, right? I love me some Microsoft Excel. It's a tool. It's a tool that a lot of people are scared of. A lot of people are you know, it's scared of in a way that, okay, let's leverage this for larger than just creating a table. 
right? Um, so those folks that have not achieved a level of data comfort will not become data literate and will be even that much more intimidated by AI, right? And they'll say, I, I don't even want to touch it. Um, but it can be used for a darn good purpose, just like Excel can be used for a darn good purpose and the internet and a PC and however far back you want to go. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I think that constantly learning is something that is really, really important right now in 2023. And as we move into 2024, uh, AI is going to be developing and I would encourage everybody that's watching this to just constantly upskill themselves, uh, you know, because this is going to be that revolutionary over the next two to three years. Yeah. The genie's out of the bottle basically, isn't it? There's no, there's no kind of, uh, putting it back in. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you look at it in a comparison to to Excel, I mean, you're probably, you know, creating a GPT, your own personal GPT. I mean, that's we're talking pivot tables and macros in, in Excel equivalent. That's, that's terrifying. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. And but but I also think that it's very important that, for example, this sort of conversation is had. Now, other people might have completely differing opinions to you and I, and they might have some really valuable input that they can add to it. But that's what the industry needs to do, because when you look at the contingent workforce industry and its impact on the services procurement or statement of work industry services procurement is so big it's like 20 trillion dollars spend annually across the whole world it's gigantic um it's very complicated and it's um it's very embryonic in in its in terms of its spend management because it's incredibly varied it could be anything no two projects necessarily are the same but that but that is something that's that the organizations are having to get control of now having to start look at and and, and technology providers are having to address in a meaningful way. And that does create opportunity. And I think the advent of AI just at really accelerates the ability to dig into that problem. Um, but in the meantime, I think also people need to understand um, where the differences are and not try to cram one thing into another. So we were talking about um, you put forward a quote or you were doing some work for somebody and they said, I don't want to know how many hours it is. I had a really interesting conversation um, with a uh, head of procurement of a large um, construction um, uh, construction kind of project uh, delivery organization. So they're basically providing surveying services and all sorts of different services around massive construction projects all over the world. So, so there, the interesting thing for them is twofold. One is typically services procurement is classed as part of indirect spend. But for them, it's actually their direct spend is is services where it's like, you know, architects and surveyors is their product. So they're buying mm -hmm. that from people, subcontracting and pushing that through to the client. And and whereas their goods and materials, it sits within kind of like direct, uh, indirect, sorry. Sure. Um, so that one interesting thing. But another interesting thing was this guy was saying, you know, he really believes in technology. He wants to take things forward. He knows statement of work is not contingent workforce. But his point was, I still want to know roughly what that price that that supplier has given me breaks down into. Um, and that threw up a really interesting argument for me. And I'd be, I'd be interested in your viewpoint on it because yes, it does. If you take it of, a, of a, an arbitrary measure of what's the effort involved in doing that, but also what's the kind of like intellectual IP element of what that service provider is delivering. Now you could say that within a knowledge worker, the same thing exists. But if you're delivering a service on an outcome basis, it kind of becomes a bit of a moot point to me around how long it's going to take, because ultimately they're saying, I can deliver this for you. I'll take the risk that I'm going to deliver it within these time frames, and I'm going to charge you that that amount of money. Do you, do, you know, would you still be drawn towards trying to say, yeah, I still want to know what that is on an hourly rate? Or, or do you kind of see that as how that diverges at that point? No, I think that you need to be flexible uh, when it comes to, you know, what level of granularity do you want? Uh, there should be some <laughs> questioning. You know, you, you, again, it's it's all about uh, removing that you don't know what you don't know. If there's something that down the road, down the road, you could see, you know what, I could understand how this could be an important piece of information to capture. It doesn't hurt to ask. And it doesn't hurt to implement a policy that has the, the buy-in from multiple different stakeholders within your organization, whether it's procurement or HR, to this is how we're going to conduct business and this is why. Uh, and also, 
there's an exception policy. If we're not going to capture it for certain uh, situations, what are those situations and when are, when is that acceptable? So again, it comes back down to, to, to documentation and to policy. I know it's boring, but leverage a certain generative AI uh, situation to create the bones and, uh, of that policy, the skeleton of that policy, and then build it out with your unique knowledge that is scarce. Um, and again, that can help to foster a, a better situation, it improves communication, it improves your own robustness as an organization, and says, all right, we're a legitimate operation here. And if a vendor it wants to push back, you say, listen, here, here's the policy, and it's signed off by all the relevant you know, folks within the organization. And this is just how we conduct business. You don't like that. I get it, but that's how we conduct business. Uh, and hopefully, a lot of times, if you deliver it like that, they're going to be, okay. <laughs> they're going to jump on board yeah i mean what you what you're describing there is a clear motivation within the buying organization to get value and to understand and it's not as i said it's a very very meaningful spend for almost all organizations you know the the figures i've heard kind of from from experts in the procurement sector are that services spend on average across all different types of organizations across the world it's roughly 50 percent of spend um yep. Obviously, in a manufacturing heavy organization versus a bank, for example, they're going to be a different skew, but on average. So it clearly is very meaningful trying to get to that value. And so people are addressing it and they and it's and it, and it and it makes sense to address it. But it's kind of always fallen into the too difficult box previously. And this is where AI, dedicated technologies, dedicated expertise can help move that along and solve that problem. But I do agree that flexibility is also an important part of it because. You, you can't necessarily just instantly put things, everything in one single framework. You've got to move along, uh, move along the tracks with with this type of thing. Um, just one other thing that I thought was quite interesting was. Another thing that causes there to be crossover with with knowledge based services procurement versus contingent workforce is ultimately it's still work being done. And. Yep. This is still work being done by people um, using AI, um, not the AI doing the work. Um, and so ultimately, that requires things like the ability to track which resources you have on the pitch, as it were. Who's accessing our systems? Who's got right to enter the building? Where are these people? Who's, who's doing X, Y, and Z? So I think that is another reason why sometimes it can get kind of confused and crossed over with the contingent workforce element where that is clearly a significant thing that has to be managed in the contingent workforce space but it's but the, but there's but there's definitely still that separation that needs to take place because yes you need to know who's on the pitch you need to have compliance and control around the people that are working maybe on your site or using your equipment for example um but that's where because of that that is uh relevant to an individual because they might need a badge to enter your office for example but actually if you're getting a piece of time-based delivery as part of a statement of work that shouldn't really matter which individual it is it might matter that it's as a senior associate doing that work for that many hours because that's what contracted but it doesn't matter whether it's sarah or pete um so so that's that's a subtle difference but you can see why it's confused at the moment. Um, and it's partly because, as I say, it's quite nascent of people trying to get on top of this. And some of the drivers are the regulatory side of things where it's 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 pushed people across into this kind of quasi statement of work. And then now people are saying, well, that's that's not good enough. We need to separate them out. So it is moving down the path of evolution, but it's still fairly early on in it in, in its stages, um, which is why I think it makes this kind of conversation particularly interesting, certainly to me and to other people I know, hopefully um, in the industry, because it's not really the sort of thing that I've heard being spoken about that much. I don't know about you. No, well, it's interesting because you said that, well, listen, with a contingent staff augmentation worker, we just we're going to charge hours. Right. We want we want to check out hours versus with a SOW project oriented work. We're going to check that things get done right? There's a big difference there. The things getting done is an outcome. The hours that are being charged is not an outcome, right? It's an input to receiving value or quality work out of those hours, right? 
And the assessment of, well, how much work was done by these staff org worker? Did they get exactly what they were brought on to do? You know, are, are they checking that box? And a lot of times, and I had a little bit of a back and forth on LinkedIn about this this week, was, uh, well, are we capturing that information on the staff org worker? Well, kind of, yeah. But the only way is through worker quality surveys that are generally voluntary response and have about a 25% response rate uh, and also are very, very subjective by manager to manager going to assess different folks in very different ways versus an SOW where you're talking about an outcome and a deliverable, did that deliverable get met as per the contract? Yes. Usually that's pretty darn binary, right? Yes or no versus the staff org worker. Did they get done what they were brought on to do for the contract. Well, it's not a contract, right? They've been brought on to you know, work 40 hours a week while somebody else is out or on this special project that is a short-term basis. And they made it to the end of their assignment. It was not an uh, involuntary or voluntary turnover. Um, and they're now gone and we liked them. And you hear that 25% of the time. Um, so you need to really consider, okay, are we going to have a policy again to require all hiring managers to give us worker quality feedback on their workers. I don't see why that would be something you say no to. That's something you say, well, yeah, obviously we're going to spend 30 million, 20 million, hundred million dollars on contingent labor spend. I want to make sure that we're, our worker quality scores are coming in through the roof, right? If I have a, the ability to say yes or no on projects, I should have a very similar ability to assess my uh, you know, contingent workforce and the suppliers that they're coming from in a very similar type of a manner. It might be different because we know that projects and staff hog, as we've talked about for the last hour, are not the same thing. However, you should still have data on which you can make decisions going forward. Yeah, yeah, that's a super relevant point. And I think it highlights that <clears throat> the um, the structure and organization about how this work is done, whether it's a contingent workforce scenario, people's time, or whether it's an outcome-based statement of work, both of them need tightening up. They need to have a better framework around them within organizations. They need more policy around them, exactly as you said at the start of the conversation, because ultimately you can't say one is always going to be better than the other. In terms of getting work done, you need to have the channels available. You might need a, you know, a gig marketplace channel to get certain things done under a credit card. You've got your permanent employees. You've then got your contractors, your temps. You've got your outsource service provision, your consulting firms and all that sort of thing. You need, to, if you know... A, a, a great CEO once kind of said to me, I just need to know the um, what is the most optimal use of all the resources that are available to me as a, as a strategic you know, play. Where do I where do I put my resources? Where which pieces do I move? So there's horses for course. Don, you know what you tell them? You tell them it depends. Yeah, oh, well, just yeah, I'd say, look, ring Chris. He, he may <laughs> say it depends, but he'll tell you in a better way than that. Um, so So what I was going to kind of say around that was, if you tighten up the criteria around measuring work that gets done under staff augmentation, it's then much easier to make a comparison of that against a statement of work or an outsourced method of getting that work done. By the same token, if you tighten up what you're measuring or how you're defining what it is that's going to be done around in a statement of work scenario, that's going to be clearer as well. And it's going to be clear what you're getting, what the value is and how much it costs. And therefore you can make that comparison more effective because that's where organizations really need to get to. They're just, it's just a question of piece of work needs doing and what's the most effective channel to get it done. And, and what you were talking about, about the changing nature of organizations, size, shape, COVID had a massive effect, growth of the gig economy, people working remotely, all that sort of thing. It has changed. So organizations need to be able to deal with ever more volatile market conditions. They need to be able to flex up and flex down. It makes the contingent workforce more important. It makes outsource suppliers yes. more important. Um, and it, and in, in the way that there may be less, potentially less people in kind of set permanent roles now, it makes those that are more important as well, retaining them, training them, upskilling them. So it's a really interesting scenario for us to be looking at. And I think um, having it under that overarching banner of just getting work done, for me, that always ticks the logic box of, it's just getting work done. There's just different ways to do it. So um, plenty of plenty of uh, way to go on it. But I think I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've actually, I feel like I've learned looking inside your mind as your approach to this. 
Um, you put across some great points about the pros and cons of looking at it in different ways. But ultimately, the situation that most people find themselves in at the moment is that they don't really have any information to even start getting worried about. So the steps that need to be taken to actually get to that point. But if they can go in there armed with understanding the type of information they're going to need to collect, the reasons for that and what they ideally going to get out of it, um, that's going to be a good position for them to be in compared to people five years ago. Yeah, I, I, and I'll just, you know, I, I know we're wrapping here, but I could go on for another hour and a half with you. Uh, maybe over a pint next time over in yeah. London. Um, but it, it comes down to, you know, folks asking themselves questions. What data do we have and what are we doing with it? And if you don't know the answers to those questions then start, you know, again, plant that tree today. Start asking questions and saying, oh, well, my goal is to make better decisions. My goal is to, you know, uh, have cost savings for the, the company as a whole, which ultimately might help you at the end of the year come Christmas time when, when bonuses might be handed out. Um, so start driving the value, leverage the data that you have. And if you don't have it or if you're, you know, it's not easy to use, work with somebody to make sure that it's a lot easier to make your job that much easier. Yeah, absolutely. And if you, if you, if you got, if you got other questions and you want insights, don't forget to make use of the tools that are available out there. I feel like that, that whole, uh, uh, topic of, of trying to use generative AI at least once a day. It's, it's a great uh, remover of procrastination. Um, it's, that's one of the things we've looked at with requirement scoping. One of the problems is you've got a blank page. Where do you start? Yes. And, and that's what generative AI, the large language models are incredible. Whatever it is, you know, you're thinking about doing, what dog breed should I get? You know, the thing I found it, find interesting is people try to ask the questions in the same way they would ask Google. But after a little while of interfacing with these platforms, you start asking things in a slightly different way. Um, and I think that's something that people need to upskill themselves with. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed that at all. Curiosity and uh, creativ creativity are two of the very important skills going forward. I thought it would be IT and my daughters are going to be IT developers. And that was uh, you know turned on its head 12 months ago when ChatGPT rolled out. Uh, we need to make sure that we're taking advantage of our humanness and our ability to think beyond what has already been documented. And that does require a lot of creativity and curiosity, um, but it requires us to, to be reading and, and uh, you know, lifelong learners, I would say as well. So that's something I'm priding myself on these days. Love it. And in terms of lifelong learning and being creative, Rad Workforce Guru is the GPT you've created on LinkedIn. I'm going to be definitely looking that up, checking that out. I'll send I'll send you the link, Johnny. It's got uh, 203 right now pages of content across Deloitte, McKinsey, SIA, Everest, uh, all these different companies that have released white papers. Consolidate that information down. I actually looked for Zivio and I said, hey, tell me about Zivio. I didn't go through all 203 pages and say, hey, is Zivio in here? And sure enough, I asked the question and there they were. And I'm like, I didn't think they'd be in here uh, because I didn't, you know, I did look through a little bit and it said specifically, here is where it is. And it saved me time and learned a little bit more about Zivio. Brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, listen, Chris, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being patient when I had all my technical problems before we got started. And, and thank you so much for your input. I've really enjoyed that conversation. And I definitely think this isn't going to be the only conversation we have around this because it's just it's just the start, really. Um, yeah. So, yeah, whether it's over a beer in London or the next time I'm over in the States or or via Zoom, I very much look forward to continuing the conversation. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Annie, thank you very much. And uh, we will be in touch.